Testing? Yes. Thank you very much for that great introduction, and thank you to the organizers of this event. Um, we have a lot of distinguished speakers uh, today. Uh, of course, Richard Hoagland, as I'm sure you all know, and uh, Richard Dole and Timothy Good, Ed Grimsley. I feel like I'm opening for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and who remembers the first act, right? But um, I'll try to make this memorable for you. We're talking about the origins of the Secret Space Program. And I'm going to introduce to you some things of which you're probably already very familiar, and yet in a different way, perhaps, than you're used to thinking about it. So don't be dismayed if at the beginning this does not seem relevant, because I will show you how and why it is. A seminal event for me in the Secret Space Program began in June of 1947. No, I wasn't around in June of 1947, but historically it was a seminal event. And many of you have heard of the Maury Island Affair, a very strange, bizarre uh, incident that took place on the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Shortly after Kenneth Arnold, a pilot, gave us the term flying saucer that month, there was a UFO sighting. In this sighting, UFOs evidently uh, crashed, uh, rained debris down upon some civilians, killed a dog, according to the story, wounded a child, according to the story. And it led to a chain of events that are very, very unusual, and yet are evidence of something that took place 20 years later that shows us there was a deep connection between the UFO story, as it was promulgated back in the 1940s, and very serious political and military events of the next 20, 30 years. So, Maury Island Affair, there's a UFO sighting shortly after Kenneth Arnold gave us the famous flying saucer story. And a man that we know as Fred Crisman claimed that he, he had been involved in that incident. He claimed that people had been hurt, that he had pieces of the UFO. And what happened was, individuals of the United States uh, Army Air Force at the time, visited Crisman and his partner, Mr. Dahl, and retrieved pieces of this so-called debris of the UFO. They got on a plane, the plane crashed, and both of these Air Force officers died. These are probably the first two uh, victims, mortalities associated with the UFO phenomenon. The first two, there were many more since then, as any student of UFO history knows. So Fred Crisman is this strange guy, you know, a strange background. No one knows too much about him. He seems to have been some kind of confidence man, some kind of criminal, a crook, but maybe also an intelligence agent. There is evidence that there were uh, intelligence connections to his background. He was also somebody I like to call a wandering bishop, and I'll get to that story in a minute, because this is a striking aspect of this whole field that people have not covered because they don't understand it. Fred Crisman, 1947, seminal event in UFO history. He shows up again 20 years later, being investigated by a district attorney, Jim Garrison, in New Orleans, because of his alleged role in the Kennedy assassination. We'll come back to that in a minute. One of the people investigating the Maury Island affair and all of the UFO incidents that were taking place in the Pacific Northwest in 1947, in the months before and after the famous Roswell crash, was this man, FBI special agent in charge, stationed in Butte, Montana. He was in charge of a bunch of files we call the SM-X files. According to the FBI's own documentation, UFO matters were classified as SM-X, security matter-X. These were the original X files. This man's name is Guy Bannister. Guy Bannister is a man who will come up again in our discussion 20 years later as a suspect in the Kennedy assassination. If you saw the movie JFK by Oliver Stone, this was Guy Bannister, the actor playing Guy Bannister. Now we come to another man called Jack Martin. Jack Martin's real name is Edward Suggs. He worked as an investigator for Guy Bannister. He was another bishop. We'll get to that story in a bit. 
He's probably the same guy as the name that comes up in the files of the Office of Special Investigations of the military as Agent Jack S. Martin, who was investigating UFO incidents in California in 1949. In the movie JFK by Oliver Stone, Jack Lemmon plays Jack Martin. I'm showing you these photographs from the film so you get a kind of context if you've seen the film. You know that we're talking about real people, real individuals, and their real influence. Of course, Oliver Stone does not go into the UFO aspect of this case. These photographs have never been seen before in public. You're the first people in the entire world that is actually seeing these photographs because they're photographs that were given to me personally by a man who was involved with Jack Martin. Jack Martin, the Jack Lemmon character in JFK, the man involved, they say, in the Kennedy conspiracy in New Orleans, was also, in addition to being an investigator, in addition to being possibly a man investigating UFO incidents in California, in addition to being heavily involved in the group around Lee Harvey Oswald in New Orleans in 1963, was also a bishop in a church, in a weird church, in a church that no one had ever heard of before, in a church that even Jim Garrison didn't understand, in his own documentation, in his own writings, going back to uh, the House Select Subcommittee on Assassinations when the United States government was going through an investigation of the assassinations in the 1970s. Jim Garrison wrote a note, copies of which I have, saying, look into this church stuff because I don't understand it. Well, there's Jack Martin, dressed as a priest in the 1970s after the Kennedy assassination. His friend and associate was David Ferry. David Ferry and Jack Martin both worked for Guy Bannister. David Ferry, former Eastern Airlines pilot, a rabid anti-communist, very much involved in anti-communist activities. He is another bishop of the same church as Jack Martin. And of course, he knew Lee Harvey Oswald, as we know, in the Civil Air Patrol. In the movie, that was David Ferry, an unforgettable guy in a fake wig and fake eyebrows, um, talking about enigmas wrapped in mysteries, wrapped in puzzles, wrapped in all kinds of things. So this is the David Ferry character that um, made famous in the film. And this is an actual photograph of David Ferry dressed again as a priest, as Jack Martin was. We have co-conspirators in the Kennedy assassination, as we will see, ties back to the UFO and the space program, who were involved in a strange church, a church that didn't really exist except on paper. And this is the church the American Orthodox Catholic Church. If you review the FBI files, uh, all of the investigations that were undertaken for the Warren Commission, and later by the House Subcommittee in, 19, in the 1970s, this name will keep coming up, and no one does any background check on it, no one goes any further. Members of this church included a man called Profeta, we'll get to him in a second, David Ferry, Jack Martin, a man called Carl Stanley, who was mentioned in the FBI files, uh, Tommy Jude Baumler, Thomas Beckham, these are all names familiar to uh, researchers in the Kennedy assassination. They were all members of this church, most of whom were bishops in the church. The church had a lot of bishops, not many priests, and no congregations. Seriously. Just bishops, no priests, no congregations. Rarely did they have a building. This photograph was taken in the only building I ever knew that housed the American Orthodox Catholic Church in the Bronx, where I'm from. And I knew the church personally. I knew these individuals personally. I knew this guy, uh, this guy right here. That's Profeta, the guy who created the church. I knew him. And I was a member briefly of this group because I live practically next door. And it's a long story. And I won't get into it now. I won't bore you with it. But the other names on this list are extremely important. Ferry Martin, we already know involved in the Kennedy assassination conspiracy, at least according to Jim Garrison. Tommy Jude Baumler was a, uh, a lawyer in New Orleans, and his claim to fame, as we found out only about a year ago, was that he was the man who incorporated another church, this one called the uh, Process Church of the Final Resurrection, of the Final Judgment, rather, Process Church of the Final Judgment. This was the group that was implicated, rightly or wrongly, in the Charles Manson family, in uh, possibly the Bobby Kennedy assassination, the, it goes on and on. There are all these churches that swim underneath the radar 
that have connections to intelligence agencies, the military, and as we will see, to the space program. This was Profeta. I knew this guy personally, a Ukrainian Orthodox priest who left the Ukrainian Orthodox Church to, dis to create this uh, church of his own, the American Orthodox Catholic Church. He was picked by Thomas Dewey as the White House chaplain. Uh, there was an election between Harry Truman and Thomas Dewey. Everyone thought Dewey would win. Dewey was the Republican. Truman was the Democrat. Truman won by a narrow margin. And Profeta once showed me the letter that he got from Thomas Dewey appointing him as White House chaplain when Dewey thought he had won the election. This is how politically prominent and important he was. On the board of directors of the American Orthodox Catholic Church was J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation of the FBI, the man who gave us the X-Files and Guy Bannister and all the rest. J. Edgar Hoover was a member and on the board of directors of this phony church. Another member was Christopher Maria Stanley. He's now known as Saint Christopher Stanley. He was canonized by the guy who took over when he died. Close associate of all these guys, Ferry Martin tried to implicate him in the Kennedy assassination. He tried to implicate them in the Kennedy assassination. When Profeta had created the American Orthodox Catholic Church, he summoned all the other bishops who had been bishops with him in this church to go to New York and prevent, uh, present their, their bona fides, their bona fides, their credentials to him and to, to Hoover. The only one who obeyed this was Carl Stanley, Christopher Maria Stanley. Christopher Stanley goes to New York, he goes to Profeta, he signs on, he goes back to his home in Kentucky, he's dead less than a month later, and only two weeks after the death of David Ferry, the mysterious death of David Ferry, another bishop in the same church. Suddenly the bishops of this church were all being killed. They were all dying under mysterious circumstances all within a few weeks of each other. This story you have not heard before because no one knows what to do with the material. No one knows what to do with this information. Uh, so when it comes to churches and guys in funny hats, you know, there is some degree of mystery out there and confusion. This is the organization as I, over the years, uncovered it, starting with uh, our friend Profeta over there to Christopher Stanley, to David Ferry, to Jack Martin. These were all guys implicated in the Kennedy assassination, and they all wore funny hats. The connection was this, another funny hat, that's J. Edgar Hoover in his Masonic Shriner fez, because he was a Freemason, as I think we all know. So there's J. Edgar Hoover to Guy Bannister, the guy who investigated the UFOs in 1947, the guy who was writing up all these telexes and uh, letters headlined SM-X file, UFO sighting here, UFO sighting there. Down here is uh, Fred Crisman. He was the guy that Bannister was allegedly investigating. And next to Crisman, there's Profeta again. Profeta, who was on the same board of directors of a church as J. Edgar Hoover. All these people working in concert, all these people working together, a phony church, mysterious goings on, and really weird hats. So what does all this have to do with the space program? You're sitting there thinking, okay, this is all very strange, but what are we here for? Well, let's fall back a little bit. We'll start to see the threads come together. In the United States, the space race began on Halloween 1936. And you're looking at this charming group of individuals down there, relaxing in front of a rocket. These were America's first rocket scientists, people like Jack Parsons. Uh, Theodore von Karman, and this is the launch at Arroyo Seco in California in October 31st, 1936. The very first launching of a, of a rocket by American space engineers. Jack Parsons has a crater on the moon named after him. Jack Parsons was a co-founder of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, at Caltech in, in uh, California. When you watch the space shuttle launches or you read anything about it, you'll always come across JPL all the time. He was a co-founder of JPL. Crater on the moon named after him. Solved a lot of issues regarding solid fuel uh, storage of rocket material. Um, and at the same time, he was a follower of Aleister Crowley. The Aleister Crowley, the infamous uh, magician who created his own cult, his own religion. Uh, Mark Parsons himself, at the same time he's working on rockets, 
for the U.S. military. He's also conducting rituals in the desert trying to summon angels and demons. I'm not making this stuff up, in case you're wondering. One of his co-workers, one of his partners in his ritual working, his ritual magic, was L. Ron Hubbard, the man who later went on to found Scientology. Hubbard stole Jack Parsons' money, stole Jack Parsons' girlfriend, ran to Miami, and bought a boat. Um, in later years, Hubbard would speak very fondly of Aleister Crowley, claiming he had met him. He never did. Crowley died in 1947, before Hubbard had even actually heard of him. But Parsons was investigated by the FBI as a security risk because he was involved in occult workings. But at the same time, Parsons is a brilliant scientist. Well, just as he's getting ready to leave the United States through all the pressure of the FBI investigations, there's a mysterious explosion at his home. He dies under very mysterious circumstances. The house literally blows up with him in it. Theodore von Karman was the leader of the group that founded the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, he has a crater on the moon named after him. Born in Hungary, studied in Germany. He was a brilliant rocket scientist as well. And he formed the Jet Propulsion Laboratory with a couple of other people, Frank Molina and, of course, Parsons, Ed Foreman, and a Chinese scientist, another brilliant man, called Tian Sui Sun. Tian Sui Sun goes on to later fame in another area of rocket science and space science. So von Karman was a guy, shown here, by the way, with a Nazi scientist down here. This is Tian up here, and this is von Karman. Uh, this scientist, uh, von Karman had known before in Germany and was instrumental in getting him to come to the United States to work on the space program with him. Tien was the man they sent to debrief Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun, of course, was the, the Nazi scientist that was brought to the United States under something called Paperclip. Werner von Braun, uh, we'll get into in more detail just in a few minutes. But Tien was also investigated by the FBI. Everybody involved in the rocket program in the United States in the 1930s and 1940s wound up being investigated by the FBI for one reason or another. Uh, he eventually got so sick and tired, he defected to China after all of the harassment he had been undergoing by, by the FBI. And what happened? He developed China's space program. He creates the Silkworm missile that was used to such effect during the, uh, the first Iraq uh, invasion when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and all of that, he was sending Scud missiles and all of this. The silkworms were in use there in the Middle East. So Tien, starting as a patriotic American citizen helping with the space program, through all the suppression by FBI, all the harassment, gives up, basically, goes back to China, and becomes a hero in China, develops, jumpstarts the Chinese space program. When we're talking today about the space race and the space programs, as we'll be getting into with the other speakers, Keep in mind the fact that it began in two important places. It began in Germany with the rocket systems and the rocket development in Germany at Pinemunde, Nordhausen, which we'll get into in a second. But it also started in the United States. And the reason that China is launching rockets today and launching satellites is because of this man, who could have been part of our space program for the rest of his life, and instead because of all sorts of political nonsense, wound up going to China and giving them a space program almost uh, complete. At the same time in Germany, in the same year, almost the same, the same month, 1936, we have Fritz Goslau of the Argus Company. He begins work on remote-controlled aircraft. And a few years later, December of 1942, we have the first launch, successful launch of the V-1. Uh, if you've been following uh, history channel stuff about uh, World War II and the Blitz and all of that, you'll know about the V-1s and the devastating effect that they had. This is a picture of the V-1 at the time, and this is another one. Later termed the world's first cruise missile. These were launched from aircraft, dropped the air, the V-1 would drop from a plane and then go on its way. Uh, aimed at London, of course, and later, as we know, at Antwerp. Uh, devastating weapon, resulting in almost 23,000 civilian deaths at the time. But at the same time, back in 1941, we have the first jet-assisted takeoff launch in California by the von Karman Group. Jack Parsons is here. We have Jack Parsons right here watching the takeoff of the first jet-assisted takeoff 
uh, plane, a jet a powered plane. So here we have the rocket scientist who's also an occultist and the follower of Alistair Crowley and a member of all kinds of other occult organizations involved in this, these important, important events of the rocket program. In 1944, of course, we have the V2. Uh, the Germans launched the V2. Actually, more people were killed making the V2 than were killed by the V2 because of slave labor in Germany and because of the concentration camp labor that was brought to Nordhausen and later to uh, Mittelbau Dora uh, concentration camps and the, the factories attached to Buchenwald, uh, more people were actually killed making these V2s than were actually killed in, in, in suffering under them. So the Nazi rocket program as we know it started at Pinamunda, was later relocated, and the person in charge of this was General Walter Dornberger and his assistant was Werner von Braun. We'll get back to them in a second. Another important personality in aviation medicine this time was Dr. Hubertus Struckholt. He's a man in charge of all sorts of horrendous experiments on living persons in the camps, and yet is considered the father of aviation medicine. He was brought to the United States. He was given his own institute at Randolph Air Force Base in Texas, and they had a building named after him until the local daughters of the American Revolution decided that having a building named after this guy was probably not the best message to send to our next generations of young people studying medicine, so they took the name off. People were aware that Strickhold was basically a monster. We've all heard of Operation Paperclip, I think. Uh, started as uh, Operation Crossbow, Operation Overcast. The British were trying to get the scientists, Russians were trying to get uh, Nazi scientists, and the Americans had their own program, which they then later renamed as Paperclip. Um, it wasn't just the men, the scientists they were bringing over, it was also their documentation. It was also as much machinery as they could possibly get. We are talking about hundreds of railroad cars, freight cars filled with documents and equipment and machinery. Not talking even about the hundreds at first, and then thousands of Nazi scientists that were brought to the United States. Here's a photograph of the team at Fort Bliss, Texas, paperclip uh, members. That's a hell of a lot of Nazi scientists. And not a single funny hat among them, I will point out. One thing that's important to remember about the space program in the United States, until 1957, it was not a civilian program. For the first 10 years, or 15 years of its existence, it was a military program. There was no NASA. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration had not been created yet. So all of these people worked for the military. The rocket program was a military program, and you have to remember that, that that's the origins of the space program, was with the Army, which later became the Army Air Force, which later became NASA. I mean, the space program went under NASA. These were supposed to be our Nazis, right? We were sold a bill of goods. I mean, the United States was told, told us, oh, these people are not really Nazis. They were Germans. They were scientists. They were helping out. They were working for us, uh, you know. They really weren't believers. Yeah, right. Why then, if this is so, did we bring the best and the brightest to the United States, give them whatever they wanted, all the resources that they wanted, whatever they needed, whatever they asked for? And the Soviet Union was the first country to launch a satellite into space. If they were really working for the United States and they had become born-again American patriots and card-carrying Republicans, yes, Republicans, um, how did it happen that we didn't get a rocket into space, we didn't get a satellite into space, that the Russians were the first? Well, what happened? Weren't they sabotaging our space program since the very beginning? These are the true believers. This is just a handful of the people you'll come across when you research this. Walter Dornberger later becomes the head of NASA, later gets a board position with Bell Aerospace in the United States, is considered a rabid Nazi by military intelligence officials who are doing background checks in Germany. They've got witness statements, they've got documents, they've got everything they need to put Dornberger in jail for the rest of his life. Those documents are buried. Werner von Braun was an SS major. There are photographs of Werner von Braun in an SS uniform. The SS was not the Rotary. It was not the Boy Scouts. You didn't just, you know, kind of join the SS because it would further your career. That, no, 
That didn't work that way. In order to join the SS, you had to prove your racial purity, going back to the year 1750. There had to be no untermenschen in your background, right? No Jews, no Gypsies, no Slavs, no Democrats. No. Nobody like that in the background of your racial purity. You had to prove this, and you had to maintain a certain, a certain degree of involvement with the SS all the time. The SS was a pagan cult. The SS forbade mention of Christian holidays, even, in their, in their documentation. The SS was extremely pagan, was extremely anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, anti-everything else. If you had a rank of major in the SS, you did not get that automatically. You got that because you proved yourself. And Werner von Braun was proven later to have been involved in meetings discussing slave labor requirements for the, for the rocket uh, systems at Pinamunda and also at Mittelbau. He was involved in these discussions. He knew about the killings of prisoners, the, this, the torture of prisoners. He was involved in all of that. It didn't matter to Werner von Braun. At the same time that he's working for us, we bring him over under paperclip. He's now in the United States. What is he doing? He's sending classified materials out of the country to his comrades back in Germany. We know this. It's part of the documentation. It's part of the record now. These files have been declassified. Werner von Braun was working against the United States almost from the beginning. This is a scandal, you know. But yet we consider him the father of the American space program. I mean, he's the one who got us to the moon, right? Kurt Debus was the first director of the Kennedy Space Center, the first director of the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral in Florida. He was a member of the SS and the SA, the Sturmabteilung, right, the brown shirts, the stormtroopers, two other Nazi organizations. This is the man who turned in his friends and co-workers to the Gestapo if they made disloyal remarks. This was a true believer, once again. As I say, he was an SS officer. The Allies considered the SS a criminal organization for very good reason. And yet, we put this guy in charge of the Kennedy Space Center. Theodor Zobel, another, another scientist, performed experiments on prisoners in the wind, wind tunnel experiments. We brought him over. He worked for us. Hubertus Strickle, as I mentioned, tortured prisoners, killed people just for experiments, dumped them into freezing cold water to see how long they would survive, stuff like that. Jump starts the Aviation Medicine Institute at Randolph Air Force Base. George Rickey, very famous Nazi, murdered prisoners, with his, personally murdered them at the Middle Baldora site. Right, is given positions with, with American corporations in the United States. Emil Salmon worked as an engineer at Wright-Patterson, as you can see. He torched a synagogue. Heinz Gesicke, rocket engineer. His family in the United States during the war was spying for the Nazis. He was fine. He was okay. Denazified. Otto Ambrose. We've all heard of Otto Ambrose, probably. Executive at IG Farben. This is the guy involved in administering the uh, experiments in Cyclone B, the gas that was used in the death camps. He gets a job with W.R. Grayson Company. Leonard Alberts gets a job with the Bechtel Corporation, all big American corporations, all very important members of the military industrial complex. His co-workers hated him, that he was just too Nazi even for them, and some of them were Nazis. Didn't hurt. Didn't hurt him at all. They moved him from position to position, but they kept him on. In May 29, 1947, to give you an idea of how badly the Nazi paperclip scientists were sabotaging the American space program, the United States attacked Mexico with a missile. A missile, this one, the Hermes missile, based on the V-2 design, was launched by German scientists at White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. It went up, and then it took a right. And it wound up in Juarez, Mexico, just outside of a heavy populated area hit the ground, blew a crater 50 meters across. We actually bombed Mexico with a missile in 1947. The Mexican government was not amused. You know, it's like, you know, we have people going across the border this way, you're sending missiles this way, what's up? Well, the Germans in charge of this had sabotaged the guidance system so that it wouldn't go where it was supposed to go. And the American engineers who were responsible for some of these experiments were complaining like mad to the Pentagon, saying that these guys are nuts. You know, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. They are not really on our side. Well, 
we're going to now move into another area. But just for a second, we think about this situation, this scenario. We had German scientists working for us, stationed at military bases in the United States, who were totally unmonitored. They could leave the base at any time. They would go walking through town. They opened up mailboxes. They were receiving mail from Europe. They were sending mail out to Europe. A lot of it went to Eastern Europe because they had colleagues who had been taken by the Soviets in order to help their German scientists, Nazi scientists, colleagues. In the Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc, they were sending American blueprints over to Eastern Germany, to East Germany and to, to Russia. At the same time, they're working in the United States. These records have since been declassified, not all of them. I mean, God forbid we should declassify records that are 60 years old from World War II, right? You know, you're, you're wondering right now, is there a secret space program? Well, there was a secret space program in the 1940s, for sure. There was a secret space program in the 1950s. We didn't know what was going on. As an American growing up, with the threat constantly of the atomic bomb, and, you know, the Russians were going to bomb us and they were, we were all going to die, and I had to hide my head under a desk because that would save me. Growing up with this, we thought that Werner von Braun was a good German. He was not a Nazi, he was on our side. Later, only later, only in the last few years, have we been able to find out that these guys had never been really on our side. They were true believers in their cause. The Nazi party was not just a political party. You know, it was not Republicans and Democrats, or like we have in the States. It was not people concerned about if we're going to have an ordinance for running a, a cable line or water or sewer. They cared nothing about that. The Nazi party was a cult of true believers. Just because they lost the war doesn't mean they lost their true faith. So they maintained it through thick, thick and thin. They looked down on their captors in the United States. To them, it was a toss-up. Do we go to Russia? Do we go to the United States? There was no ideological choice being made. It was strictly a pragmatic one. Where are we going to get the best deal? You know, They were operating on their own. They were operating with their own agenda. So in 1947, we have the Cold War. First, we bomb Mexico. And we apologize for that later. Then we have the Kenneth Arnold sighting. We have the Maury Island affair. We have famously Roswell. In 1947, that same year, the CIA is created. The Department of the Air Force is created. A year later, Truman defeats Dewey. I mention this because of the, the relationship to the other in incidents that we're talking about. In 1950, the Korea War begins. Okay, so now we're in, we're in Cold War mode. Russians have poured across the border into North Korea. Okay, the brainwashing thing starts. Everybody's freaking out about the, the weird science that the Russians are using to brainwash American soldiers. Okay, a person very involved in this, in all the hysteria around this, in 1952, holds a seance in a farmhouse in Maine. The man is, no, not the Pope, not the funny hat guy, the other guy, Andrea Puharich. Andrea Puharich was a medical doctor, he was an inventor, he was a military man, a captain in the army, stationed at, Fort, at Camp Dietrich, later Fort Dietrich, Edgewood, Ar Edgewood Arsenal later, he was stationed at. This is the area of the United States, the military, that's involved with chemical and biological weapons. Puharich, however, was involved in trying to weaponize paranormal abilities. Puharich's focus in 1952, as early as 1952, is how can we use ESP, telepathy, all these things, in a military capacity. Since now we're facing a Cold War with people who use brainwashing methods, Puharich suddenly becomes a hot ticket item. He's talking about using the human brain and the powers of the brain to do all sorts of horrible things to people. He brings together nine people in a seance. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you realize who these people are. One of them is Arthur Young. Some of you may have heard of Arthur Young. He wrote a lot of very well-received books, The Reflexive Universe, The Geometry of Meaning. Arthur Young was a, was a great guy. He was the inventor of the Bell helicopter. He sold his rights in all of that. He left military uh, engineering, military development at the end of World War II in order to pursue full-time his interest in the paranormal. He studied yoga, Eastern religions, ESP, psychokinesis, astrology, you name it, he was into it, Arthur Young. His wife, Ruth Forbes Payne Young, she was also at the seance. So we have Arthur Young, the inventor of the Bell helicopter, the guy who created the Bell helicopter, along with Larry Bell, his partner. 
We have his wife, the excessively nomenclatured Ruth Forbes Payne Young. That's all her husband. So she's married first to a Forbes. John Kerry, our presidential candidate, was a Forbes. This is a very old, very famous family. She was married to George Lyman Payne. Payne was a direct descendant of one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence and related, uh, coincidentally, to an actor called Robert uh, Treat Payne. Long story. But anyway, Ruth Forbes, also married to a Payne, also married to Arthur Young. Not at the same time, you know, one after the other. She has a son, Michael Payne, who then gets a job at Bell Aerospace through Arthur Young's influence, because Arthur Young helped create the company. Her son needs a job. He gets him a job at Bell Aerospace in Texas. Her best friend is Mary Bancroft. Mary Bancroft was the longtime mistress of Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles, as you know, was a famous head of the CIA, the one that Jack Kennedy fired over the Bay of Pigs when he told Dulles he was going to split the CIA into a million pieces. Alan Dulles was the one who was fired by Kennedy and who later wound up on the Warren Commission investigating Kennedy's death, very conveniently. So these are two people, two of the nine. So Michael Payne's boss, right, the boss of Michael Payne, Arthur Young's son-in-law, is none other than General Walter Dornberger. And he's shown here. That's Dornberger over here, and that's Himmler over here. And they all got hats. So these are all guys. So Michael Payne has his, these direct connections right back to Paperclip, back to the space program. Michael Payne's wife is also named Ruth. She's Ruth Payne. Ruth Payne is a Quaker. She likes folk dancing, walks on the beach, uh, candlelit dinners, and the Russian language. Allegedly, she's studying Russian. That's Ruth Payne. That's Michael and Ruth in Irving, Texas. That's Ruth Payne again. She's sitting way over on the left. Here is a woman called Marguerite, Marguerite Oswald. Here is Marina Oswald. The picture was taken on November 22nd, 1963, the day that Kennedy was assassinated that evening. They're photographed in Ruth Payne's living room in Irving, Texas. It was Ruth Payne who got Lee Harvey Oswald the job at the Texas School Book Depository, right on the route where he would be able to assassinate the president. That's Ruth Payne. Ruth Payne had visited Arthur Young and her mother-in-law, Ruth Forbes Payne Young, in Philadelphia in September of 1963. She had Marina Oswald, this Russian defector, the wife of Lee Harvey Oswald, and her children living with her in her house. What was she talking about to Arthur Young, I wonder? Did she ever mention the fact that, hey, I got this Russian defector and his wife living with me in Irving, Texas? Lee Oswald, maybe you heard of him. He was a Marine. He defected to the Soviet Union, wanting to become a Russian citizen. He redefected back to the United States. He did all of this, and the guy's still only 24 years old. That's pretty good for a 24-year-old. A Marine, somebody involved in the Atsugi Air Base and radar technicians, a guy who spoke Russian fluently enough that his Russian-born wife thought he was Russian. Now, I don't know about you. I studied a lot of languages in my time. I mean, Mandarin, Spanish, French, Italian. I've done a lot of languages. I've studied Russian. Russian is a damn hard language to learn. And yet this young kid with no, hardly any formal education, just barely got out of high school, joins the Marines and learns to speak fluent Russian like that, so much that he can convince Marina that he's fluent, that he's, he's a native Russian. So Marina, Marina Oswald, the niece of a KGB, uh, excuse me, an NKVD, an Army Military Intelligence uh, officer, marries Lee Harvey Oswald, this Marine defector, very famous defector, and they decide to go back to the United States. Ruth Payne wants to learn Russian. That's her story. Oh, I'd love to learn Russian from Marina Oswald. So she gives her some room in her house because they're broke. And then Lee goes to Texas and, well, the rest is history. So here's the nine. Here's the, the connection of these nine people. I didn't mention all the people of the nine. We'll get to that. But they're mostly DuPonts, Astors, Forbes, etc. These are the wealthiest families in the United States at the time. Blue blood Americans with long pedigrees going back to the Mayflower or to the Declaration of Independence in some cases. 
representatives of these families were at this bizarre seance. And during this seance, in Maine, they were contacted, according to all the published documentation, I'm not making this stuff up and I'm not speculating, Puharich himself published this documentation, saying that aliens, a group of nine, contacted the group of nine who were at this seance and said, we are nine, you are nine, we're giving you the mission you know, to help transform life on the planet. And what was their first major contribution was you know, having to do with the assassination of President Kennedy. So this nine, to me, is very strange. We have to ask ourselves a lot of questions. Did that somehow promote you know, evolution on this planet, or did that do just the opposite? So there's Arthur Young. There's his daughter-in-law, Ruth Payne, Lee Harvey Oswald to Kennedy. The connections are very tight. And another member of the nine, of course, was an Astor, as I mentioned, Ava Alice Muriel Master, Astor. So all American aristocracy. September 12, 1962, Kennedy makes his famous, we shall go to the moon, we choose to go to the moon in this decade, and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The last time an American president talked to Americans this way. We're going to do things not because they're easy, because they're hard, because that's what we're going to do. He told Congress of the moon mission May 25, 1961. In September 62, over a year later, he reiterates this in a very famous speech. You can catch it on YouTube. It's everywhere. Very brilliant, very passionate speech about what we're going to do. And then, of course, in November of the following year, he's assassinated. What does all this have to do with what we're talking about? Okay, in New Orleans... Before the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald gets a job with the William Riley Coffee Company. That coffee company still exists. He went down there to get a job. He worked for a short time. He quits. He tells a co-worker, hey, I've just found the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, according to the quotation. He's getting a job at NASA. Well, in 1957, we sent up, we didn't send up, the Russians sent up a Sputnik, and that scared the hell out of the American military establishment. It scared the hell out of the American people. They said, we have all these Nazi scientists, you know, what are we getting for our, you know, what bang for the buck are we getting here? So we have to do something about this. And so they put the fear of God into the Nazi scientists and said, okay, listen, guys, you know, enough is enough, we fooled around enough, now we have to actually do something. And so the government took control of the space program away from the military and gave it to a civilian organization, NASA. The problem with that was they moved the Nazi scientists from the military to NASA. So it was a change in name only. You know, suddenly you have military scientists who are Nazis, who are true believers. Now they're working for a civilian agency for NASA under the U.S. government. We didn't really change anything. Direct military control was lost, but the Nazis were still in command. After the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald leaves the William Riley Coffee Company. He never does work for NASA although we find out that he was probably working out of an office at the NASA site that was a, an employment agency for the CIA. This is something that's also come up recently. Anyway, he leaves William Riley. He leaves New Orleans, goes to Texas. After the assassination, his co-workers also all get jobs at NASA. At NASA. They're coffee company clerks, and they got jobs at NASA. As I mentioned, Ruth Payne had visited his wife, uh, visited Arthur Young and his wife. Arthur Young believes, or he's been told, that he's been in contact with these nine supernatural beings. Andrea Puharich, the guy who organizes this, the captain in the army involved in weaponizing the paranormal, he's the guy who discovers Uri Geller, the Israeli psychic who bends spoons by looking at them. He brings Uri Geller to the United States. He gets him involved at the Sanford Research Institute run by Scientologists, as it turns out. All this other stuff is going on. Uri Geller eventually says he got tired of it. He thought that he was being run by Puharich as an intelligence asset. He really felt that Puharich was an intelligence agent running him uh, as an agent for one of the intelligence agencies. But part of that program was that he felt from time to time he was being put in contact with extraterrestrial beings. You know, Geller was mystified by what was going on in his brain by all of this. Now, whether you think about Uri Geller as being genuine or not, or a player or not, or whatever, uh, Geller is pretty open and honest about his relationship with Puharic. He didn't like him, he distrusted him, and eventually he cut off relations with him. 
as I said, Ruth Payne finds Lee the job at the Texas School Book Depository. So then in New Orleans, after the assassination, Garrison remembers David Ferry, Jack Martin, all these guys, Guy Bannister. He conducts his own investigation. And he finds that all of these guys were bishops in a church, except for Guy Bannister, who was like the Pope or something, um, of the, the Vatican in New Orleans. And then Guy Bannister and Fred Crisman were the guys who jump-started the UFO thing in 1947 after Kenneth Arnold. So he calls in Fred Crisman. Guy Bannister is dead. He died in 1964, again mysteriously. So Fred Crisman then is called in. He's interrogated. Nothing much comes of that. So what was the secret space program, from my point of view, from the 1940s? We bring in Nazi scientists to the United States. In 1947, we have the famous Roswell incident. The Roswell debris, we know, is taken to Wright Air Force Base, we eventually Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Wright Field at the time, which is the same place where we bring Walter Dornberger, Werner von Braun, and everybody else preliminarily. We bring them all together. All these guys are together in 1947 in one place. At the same time, we have all these UFO sightings. We have Nazi scientists in the space program. We're afraid the Russians have the bomb. Uh, as it turns out, a lot of people had the bomb in those days. We have a group of wealthy Americans, all involved in the militarization of the paranormal and they make this contact with this extraterrestrial group called The Nine. I wrote a book called Sinister Forces. The very first volume is called The Nine, and it focuses on this strange bit of connections. We have these, this family, this group of families, having a seance in 1952 in Maine, talking to aliens in a spaceship hovering over the Earth, they say. And then later we find tendrils leading out from that seance directly to the Kennedy assassination, among other things. But the Kennedy assassination being the most important and the most obvious one. If you follow the Kennedy assassination, you may know of a guy called George DeMorenschild. He was a Russian CIA contract agent who eventually helped in some way uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and Marina. He was involved with them. Uh, he commits suicide before he has to give an interview uh, about all of this. Uh, in his book, his notebook, his uh, address book when he was, uh, after he was found dead, was the phone number of a man who was also involved with the Nine. I mean, Lee Harvey Oswald was surrounded by so many bishops and so many members of the Nine, the poor guy had no chance, you know. I mean, he was basically surrounded by people who all felt they had some sort of mysterious mission, and Lee Harvey Oswald was, was the guy in the middle. Oswald himself didn't have much of a connection this way. Connection to military intelligence? Probably. That fluency in Russian should tip you off right away in those days. But um, the rest of the connections to, to, to the Nine, to the assassinations before and since, are incredible. They're astonishing. We know the CIA was blamed for the Kennedy assassination. We've all heard the stories. What we don't really remember is that the CIA at that time not only was involved in protecting uh, Nazi scientists as much as they could, and other Nazis around the world, Nazi war criminals, um, involved with the Vatican, as I think we've all heard. Uh, I'm working on a story right now that I hope I'll be able to publish by the end of the year, involving the monastery route in which uh, the Catholic Church uh, really deliberately helped a lot of very famous, very prominent Nazi war criminals escape, giving them Vatican passports, safe houses. Some of the story you've heard already before. But what we don't really realize is the CIA at the time of the assassination, for instance, was heavily involved with another Nazi organization, the Galen organization, which was running uh, agents for the CIA in Eastern Europe and against the Soviet Union. Again, just like in Paperclip, these Nazi scientists were not really working for us. They were taking our money, they were giving us phony reports, they were virtually useless against the Soviet Union. As it turns out, years later, as we find out, when all the chips are in, when all the information is there, we find out they've been sabotaging us as well. Um, Alan Dulles was protecting Nazi war criminals since before the war ended. We know that in transcripts of speeches and, and talks that he had with famous Nazi leaders uh, going back to 1944 and 1945. And the fascinating thing about Alan Dulles, bringing all of these pieces of these disparate things together, was that he was a Mary Bancroft's mistress. Okay, Mary Bancroft was the friend of Ruth Forbes Payne Young. During the Warren Commission interviews with witnesses, and you can read this in the Warren Commission transcripts, 
Look for Ruth Payne. Read her. She appeared twice before the commission, talking about what she was doing in the days and weeks and months leading up to the assassination, how she knew Lee and Marina Oswald, all of these questions. Alan Dulles is part of that committee. He's sitting in. At the point where Ruth Payne starts to talk about her trip to Philadelphia to meet Arthur Young two months before the assassination, three months before the assassination, Alan Dulles cuts her off and changes the subject. He does not allow her to finish the story. Read the transcript for yourself, you'll see it. It's blatant. Alan Dulles, who's been quiet the entire time, suddenly jumps in, you know, like a defense attorney, and then suddenly says, oh no, we're not going to, you know, let's, let's talk about this instead. As she's about to say who she met, who she was dealing with, Alan Dulles changes the subject, changes the story. Her information about Arthur Young never makes it into the record, and she hasn't talked about it since. What was going on? Alan Dulles knew Mary Bancroft. Mary Bancroft was Ruth Forbes, uh, Payne's Young's best friend. There was a very deep connection there. Alan Dulles knew ahead of time, he had to, about Lee Oswald, Ruth Payne, Marina Oswald, and all of this. And he was desperate to cover up that part and make sure it never made it into the record of the Warren Commission. So we have a lot of wild stuff going on, including the fact that Ruth Payne's um, husband, Michael Payne, was working for Bell Aerospace. So what do we have? We have a garrison investigation alleging there was a conspiracy in the Kennedy assassination. The problem with Garrison trying to prove all of this is that he had a cast of characters nobody would believe, right? He had Clay Shaw, who was an unbelievable character on his own, the man that he was trying for the assassination. But he also had all these other characters. He had all these bishops, you know? He didn't know what to do with these bishops. He couldn't understand that the bishops were a front for an intelligence operation. He suspected it, but he didn't know where to go with it. Paranormal researchers, UFO personalities like Guy Bannister, like Fred Crisman, and of course employees of NASA. All of these people can be tied back to paperclip, can be tied back to the Nazi space program, the people that we brought over. This was all part of the, the problem. This was all part of what happened. Secrets were kept. Uh, there are still declassified uh, documents on the Kennedy assassination. We know that thousands of documents have yet to be declassified. Thousands of documents on World War II. Thousands of documents on the Admiral Byrd expedition to Antarctica. Right. We've classified so much in the United States alone. Now think of your own countries. I did a lot of work in Latin America. Uh, people who know know that I've been, I was in Chile in 1979 researching the Nazi influence down there and trying to find out information about Nazi technology that had been smuggled to South America. Um, under military dictatorships in Latin America, of course, there was no information. Secrecy was the order of the day. Documents were classified, shredded, burned. Things went on for 20, 30 years in Latin America, we'll never know. And yet, many of our Nazis wound up there, in Argentina, in Chile, in Bolivia, Uruguay, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, uh, Peru, everywhere. There were Nazis in hiding all of these places. They were scientists, they were SS officers, they brought technology, they brought money, vast sums of money under Otto Skorzeny. All of this was being brought and, and developed into programs. Perón used to brag about his, his, space, his own space program, developing a new jet system, a new uh, a, a faster than a speed of light kind of thing that he was talking about and bragging about because he knew he had Nazi scientists there working for him. The author Joseph Farrell, a uh, very good researcher, has written about the Bell, has written about alternative sources of energy that were being developed by Nazi scientists in South America, in Bariloche, very close to where I was uh, detained in Chile on the other side of that border. So there's a lot of secrecy yet. We know history only the declassified portions of history. The world that we know is based upon what we've been told. We can read books about history and feel that we know what's going on. But I can tell you, the, list, the history of the last hundred years is largely still classified. We live in a kind of dream world, thinking that we know what actually happened. Right now, there's information that the Japanese had detonated an atomic device in August of 1945 off the coast of Korea. And there are Japanese intelligence officers who come forward with this story and who are insisting that it took place. If that's true, we have to rewrite the end of World War II, right? Then we have to go back and say, wait a minute, what really happened? 
If we talk about paperclip, the way I was taught in school in the 1950s and 60s <laughs> was that um, the Nazis were, good, they were, these were good Germans. Werner von Braun was never a Nazi. Dornberger was never a Nazi. All these guys were on our side. As it turns out, it wasn't true. As it turns out, they were sabotaging us every step of the way. Our space program was the result of Nazis trying to stonewall us and to prevent us from getting there. Until eventually, after Sputnik, they were told, you better do it or get out. So that's what happened. We sold our soul in, in the United States, and not just the United States, believe me, other countries as well, including the Soviet Union. We sold our soul for this technology. We dealt with some of the worst war criminals in, in history. Not just even the Holocaust, but the, the idea that they had slave labor that they worked to death and replaced with other slave laborers. And these people who employed these slave laborers deliberately, who were involved in every step of that process, including the killing of these laborers also, were the people that we brought over for the space program. Our space program has its origins in people, on the one hand, like Jack Parsons, who once wrote that he was the Antichrist. He was a brilliant man, but he believed he was the Antichrist and was ushering in a new age of witchcraft, according to him. And he was a follower of Crowley and, and member of the Ordo Templi Orientis and all of this, a very brilliant guy, but a very strange guy on the one hand. And we had the Nazis on the other. You know, these were the people that were jump-starting the space program of the United States, in, starting in 1936 and going up until, well, until the moon launch. So we have to go back and relook at this history and ask ourselves, why? Why was it so necessary? Why was the space program militarily necessary? Why did they work for the army? Why did they sabotage the process as much as they could? Why did the army allow Nazi scientists to wander off the base and do whatever they wanted to do, communicate with whomever they wanted to? Fort Bliss, Texas is on the border of, of, of Texas and Mexico. That region in, in the 1940s was like Vienna during the Cold War. It was a place where spies hung out with spies. It was rife with all sorts of intelligence activity. All sorts of things were going on in that border area. All the way from the, the California... Uh, Mexico border all the way through Texas, all the way to Brownsville. There was a lot of cross-border traffic. A lot of very strange individuals crossed that border. A lot of military people, a lot of intelligence people. The Nazis were still running spies after the end of the war because they were protecting Nazi assets. They were protecting SS officers who were making their way uh, into the United States from Latin America. And people making their way from the States into places like Argentina, being paid for by Nazi uh, gold. So we have to reevaluate the history of the world since 1945. We have to go back and look at it again. If we want to know what happened, what's going on with the space program, and about breakaway civilizations, about motivations to create a space program for the rich and the powerful, we have to go back to this period of time. We have to understand why it was that we could deal with the Nazis so easily, why it was we thought that was the best thing that we could do why we gave them carte blanche, allow them to do whatever they wanted to do, why we bent over backwards for these guys, murderers. Some of them wound up in positions of tremendous influence in South America. Klaus Barbie became head of the secret police in Bolivia, an official government position. At the same time, he's running drugs, guns, and assassinating uh, communist leaders, socialist leaders, or anybody he particularly didn't like, not only in South America, but in Europe. There were assassinations taking place in Spain, in France, in Germany on the orders of people like Barbie and Operation Condor in South America. This is all part of our history. These are not footnotes. You know, we we're being told they're footnotes. We we're being told it's not central to what actually happened. Uh, I tell you, though, that's not true. As anyone who knows, who's traveled in those countries knows, the stranglehold that the Nazis and the Germans in general, that the Nazis specifically had on the economies of those countries, on the culture of many of those areas, uh, is, was incredible. You know, and in some cases still is. So, who benefited, right? Civilian control of NASA began in 57. The Nazi scientists remained in place. They were there at the very beginning of the UFO era. Many people believe the Nazis had developed the very first prototypes of the flying saucer, of wingless aircraft, of alternate energy, of the atomic bomb. The Luftwaffe had a map of Manhattan in which they were trying to estimate the damage an atomic bomb would have and how many people would be killed. This map was, was developed in 1943. 
You know, we know the evidence is there. We just have to keep looking. Something else was going on. What they told us was not the way it happened. And now my fear is in the United States, because we have the Patriot Act and because we have all sorts of ways to stifle inquiry, to stop information from getting out, more secrets can be kept, more programs can be instituted about which we will know nothing until it's too late. Kennedy was perceived as a threat to the program. He had signed treaties with the Soviets, promised not to invade Cuba. This was against the Nazi ideology. This was contrary to a Nazi platform, not an American platform. Kennedy was a very popular president, you know. But his idea of cutting a deal with the Soviets and essentially saving the world from thermonuclear war in 1962 was disregarded because many in the military thought we should have gone to war. The Nazi right-wing coalition was very strong. In the United States, it still is. If you look at who finances and who helps certain, a certain political party in the United States, you're going to find that there's tremendous uh, support from Nazi and neo-Nazi organizations for that political party. One party in particular, not the other. So you're going to ask yourself, well, what is all this about? Reagan, President Reagan, of course, was heavily supported by something called the World Anti-Communist League. The World Anti-Communist League was populated almost entirely by Nazis, former Nazi uh, officers, former people who had worked against the Soviets, uh, working for uh, fascist and Nazi dictatorships. And it was incredible stuff because they were true believers. George Patton famously said we were pointing our guns in the wrong direction. When we went after the Nazis, we should have gone after the Soviets. Um, there's a lot that uh, we could talk about, and I don't have the time, I don't think. How am I going for time? I'll just keep talking until you tell me to stop. Okay. Really? Oh, cool. Okay. In that case, the pause that refreshes. Here's the question I want to ask. What more was there at stake? Why was Kennedy killed? It had to be for some really big reason. It couldn't be because they didn't like his hair, you know. It had to be for something really specific and something big, something major, something that was going to affect the economy and the political structure, power structures that existed. Did Kennedy's insistence on going to the moon rob other projects of finances and resources that they needed? Was the moon a kind of chimera, a kind of uh, uh, quixotic dream that we should go to the moon first and show our superiority over the Soviets? Was it something that took money and power away from this inner circle of right-wing zealots, of Nazis who had a different approach to science, a different approach to the space program, people who wanted to do their own thing, and that Kennedy's insistence that we we're going to put all of our money into the space program took away power from them, gave more power to NASA, but took it away from the military and took it away from other projects. So was there, in the 1960s, a secret space program. We talk a lot about the military-industrial complex. Um, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower warned us about that in his farewell address when he left office. Um, and we've focused on that to a great deal, but we don't really know what it is. We know it has to do with guns and the army. But remember that the, that the military also was developing rockets, uh, jet propulsion, various types of missiles, um, NASA was solely occupied with visiting other planets, according to its brief. Its space science was satellites going to other planets. It was a non-military application of space technology. The military was still involved in their own aspects of space technology. And this involved missiles, it involved alternate sources of energy, it involved different types of uh, aircraft that could try to fly at tremendous speeds. Uh, a couple of, uh, about 18 months ago, as an example, I was 
invited to uh, participate as an observer uh, in, a, in a meeting of former intelligence officers uh, out in Las Vegas. Go figure. Um, and during the course of that, that time that I spent there, we visited very several military installations, and we had to have all sorts of security checks done and all of that. And you've all heard of Area 51. Well, there was, a, there was a presentation given, much like I'm giving one now, on Area 51 by one of the guys who was there, who spent his lifetime there. And he was very bitter about the fact that even the CIA could have an association where former spooks could sit down and chat and have drinks and talk about their failures or successes. But that the guys at Area 51 could not. They're still bound by secrecy laws of things that happened back in 19, the 1950s and 1960s. You might remember the U-2 incidents. You know, the Nazis had the V-2, we had the U-2. And the U-2 was our, our, our stealth uh, plane that took photographs of the Soviet Union, of other countries. It was a spy plane. That, of course, was, was developed at Area 51. That was where it was housed, that's where it was based. So all of this took place at Area 51. And Area 51, according to popular uh, understanding was a military installation, a military base. That's not exactly true. It was an intelligence operation. It had nothing really to do directly with the military. It was an indirect relationship that was, that, that was had at Area 51. So you had uh, the development of the U-2. People, of course, always say they were re back engineering, reverse engineering spacecraft or UFOs and that sort of thing there. This guy would not talk about that, of course. He poo-pooed the idea. But his presentation began with a picture of an alien and the theme song from the X-Files, right? So he starts his presentation this way, and of course everybody laughs politely or nervously, and then he goes on to give his, his talk about Area 51, and thank you. He says I have until three o'clock. Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. Oh, I've got a lot more presentations in here. Believe me, we could do this all night. Um, so he went into a lot of detail about what happened up there and how we lost more of our CIA agents in a single accident involving Area 51 than we ever lost in the field. So there was a lot going on up there, and that's still classified. He still can't really talk about it, not even to a group of former intelligence officers who had all signed secrecy oaths and everything else, and he still couldn't go into it. You know? So his presentation was rather thin, but he did talk about the U-2 programs and Francis Gary Powers and all of that, and everybody in the audience understood that when he's talking about Francis Gary Powers, the pilot of the U-2 who was shot down over the Soviet Union, we're also talking about Lee Harvey Oswald. We're also talking about Oswald's involvement with that particular part of the space program. Because Oswald was stationed, as we know, at Atsugi Air Force Base in Japan, which was one of only two bases in the world at which the U-2 would take off from. That was the base where it was kept. So the flights from Japan went over the Soviet Union. And Oswald's job as a radar operator was in the room with the traffic controllers that were sending up the U-2s. So every time we turn around, in, in these major political events, we run across the space program again, in some way, shape, or form. It was insidious. It, it involved all sorts of aspects of, of American life, things that we would never expect. Why did people who worked at Riley Coffee Company all go to work for NASA? Why did Oswald claim that he was getting a job at NASA? Why did all these other spooks and all these other strange people wind up somehow with the space program and then again with the Kennedy assassination? There is something very serious going on here. There's a very strange part of American history, and by extension, in a way, of American and world history that's taking place with the space program. If you look at the space programs in Europe, if you look at the space programs in China and other parts of the world, you will see all the connections going back to this one central uh, phenomenon of the space race between the Soviet Union and the United States. And you have to ask yourself, was it really a space race? You know, politicians on both sides may have thought it was a race. Uh, Low-level politicians may have thought this. They may have been stricken with fear that we were in a race 
against the Russians for domination of space. We may have thought this, but the scientists on either side, I think, never had any illusions about this. There was no race. There was a cooperation. You know, someone at some point decided the Soviets can go first. They'll have their Sputnik, and they'll send a dog into space, and then eventually they will send an astronaut into space. The Russians had the first go at it. How could they possibly, when we had the creme de la creme, when we had all of the best and the brightest of the Nazi space program, how did that happen? It had to have been a cooperation between the scientists themselves. This implicates or implies that there was another level of government in the world at that time. That there was another basis of cooperation, of collaboration between people that we thought were dire enemies. That there were networks of people operating throughout the world who cooperate with each other in some way, shape, or form. And this is what we have in the, in the space program. They cooperated so much that people died. People were killed. People were assassinated. Serious investigations into the UFOs led to the deaths of a lot of people. James McDonald, famous scientist who went before Congress and insisted that the UFO sightings were not the result of sightings of the planet Venus, swamp gas, or weather balloons. For this, he was ridiculed. He was later found dead. They said he committed suicide. They always say they committed suicide. That's the standard response. Murray Jessup, right, involved in the Philadelphia experiment stuff and a researcher into UFOs and all of that, commits suicide, they say, in Miami, Florida. You know, all of these people who are seriously involved in the study, uh, who try to promote it, who try to talk reasonably about it, not wild-eyed, aluminum foil hat-wearing people, you know, talking that their minds are being controlled from Venus or something, these are serious people. James McDonald was a very serious guy. He was, a, he was a scientist. He was a doctor, a PhD, a meteorologist. He knew what he was talking about. Dead. Uh, Jessup, a very reasonable guy, a very sort of scientific-minded guy, not the kind of wild-eyed guy who would believe anything that anybody ever told him, in the last month or two of his life was extremely paranoid, extremely nervous. He felt that there was something going on, that somebody was after him, and then he wound up dead in Miami. So we have these things connected with the UFO program. Why? If the UFO phenomenon is a figment of our imagination, if we're projecting stuff onto atmospheric conditions and we're seeing ghosts or something like that, why all of this secrecy? Why all the murder? Why all the suicides? What does that have to do with just believing in six impossible things before breakfast? There's something very serious, something that points to people who are willing to spill blood in the furtherance of a goal or an objective. And the best example we have of that in the last hundred years has been, of course, the, the Nazis and the SS. People who thought that to kill huge numbers of people was justified for a kind of spiritual reason. The Nazis believed very seriously. This was not propaganda. They believe very seriously in the idea that in the blood is the spirit. They believe that uh, your race carried a spiritual component and that those of inferior races, quote unquote, uh, were inferior spiritually, so it was okay to kill them. It was, in fact, it was necessary to kill them, to purify the rest of the planet, to purify the race. This was something they believed very sincerely. And they looked to American scientists who came up with this idea in something called eugenics and the race science program. So, when you have people who believe that the ends justify the means, when you have people who believe that murder is acceptable, even on a huge scale, because of the responsibility they have to jumpstart evolution, the next stage of it, and then they lose a war, do you really think they're going to go away? Do you really think they're going to say, shucks, lost the war, I guess we're all going to become Democrats? You know, it's not going to happen. It just won't happen. Many times I've, I've told people the same uh, example of Christianity. Christianity began and lived underground, in cemeteries, in catacombs, meeting secretly at night for over 300 years before it was accepted in the Roman Empire. 300 years. These people who believed in a kind of an impossible thing, a resurrected person, right? They kept on to that belief for 300 years. The Nazis lost their war in 1945, right? 65, 66 years ago. 
That's not a long time. You know. Some of them are still alive. Some of these people are still alive and they're still having influence in their own countries. They're having influence as far away as Australia. Uh, they're all over the place. You know. And as they die off, they have people who are following in their footsteps, people they've talked to, indoctrinated. Uh, they don't go away. This is a cult that does not disappear. The problem with this particular cult is that they're very well funded and they have a lot of supporters in a lot of countries. I should say, including this country, but a lot of other countries. No one is immune. They're everywhere. Okay? And I'm not saying this out of paranoia. Uh, I'm the kind of person who generally does not behave that way or think that way. But the, the facts, the documents speak for themselves. The, the presence of, of Nazis and neo-Nazis in, in this world, in general, has growing. It's not going away. I travel a lot. Uh, the last 20 years especially, I've traveled to more than maybe 40, 50 countries. And I find constantly in airports, in developing nations particularly, copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, this famous hoax that was invented by the Soviet, uh, the, uh, the Tsarist secret police back before the Russian Revolution. I mean, they're being reprinted in local languages everywhere. Uh, Henry Ford, the American inventor who invented the assembly line for making automobiles, was a notorious anti-Semite. He was part of our, the origins of our military industrial complex. His uh, assembly line technology was used to make planes and jets and bombs and tanks and everything else. Here was a guy who was as anti-Semitic as Hitler, to whom Hitler gave the highest award that Nazi Germany could give to a non-German in the same year that he gave it to Benito Mussolini. Henry Ford's writings are being reprinted around the world. His anti-Semitic diatribes that go on for pages and pages and pages are being reprinted and available everywhere. I've found it in airports in Latin America and on book, book stalls and newspaper stands in Malaysia and in Indonesia and in Singapore. I mean, everywhere. Being offered as though it was true. Being offered without criticism, without critique. There's the beginning of a wave of this kind of anti-Semitic, pro-Nazi, pro-fascist sentiment that's taking place. And it's taking place everywhere. It's taking place in the United States as, as well as anywhere else. Because people are afraid. It's the fear that we've, we've inherited. I talked briefly about uh, Charles Manson. I made a passing reference to him. Charles Manson was brilliant in a sense. He said, get the fear. That was his famous slogan. Get the fear. Become afraid. Marry the fear. Become wedded to it. This way it cannot control you. Understand the fear. You know, feel it in your bones, and then you can get past it. The idea was to fear completely, and then not to fear anything anymore. Manson famously feared nothing. I mean, at the same time, he was a great manipulator. Fear is used to control. Uh, it's used to control us in the 1950s, as I was growing up in the Cold War, we believed at any moment we were going to be bombed by the Russians or the Chinese. I don't know how the Chinese were going to do it, but we were told the Chinese were going to do it. Um, the Russians, of course, were going to bomb us at any moment. We were living with this every day. We heard the air raid silence, sirens every week. They kept testing the air raid sirens, so we would always hear an air raid siren. At that time, I lived in Chicago, and the sirens would go off. You know? They kept testing them every week. At any moment, you know, we would hear these things on the wrong day, and we knew the day had come. We would be bombed. This fear made it possible for the military-industrial complex to grow. And then, you know, things kind of quieted down. The Soviet Union fell. The Cold War was, quote-unquote, over. Nothing else to fear anymore. Of course, that would mean tremendous loss of revenue for the companies that had been based on fear. So we needed something else. Right? We needed another enemy. So Saddam Hussein came along. He was very, very convenient for us. So Saddam Hussein was a new enemy, a new scapegoat. You know, new, new people to, to hate, new people to fight against, new people to raise an army against. So everybody was happy again back in the state of Connecticut, which is virtually run by the defense establishment. Everybody got their jobs back. Um, and then, of course, famously, we had 9-11. Now, a lot of people will ask, do you believe 9-11 was created by a conspiracy? I always tell people, it doesn't matter. Look at what happened. Look at how 9-11 was used. That's what's important, really important. Because 9-11 was used the way, to go back to the 1930s, the way Hitler used the Reichstag fire. There was a fire. 
Definitely there was a fire. It took place at the German parliament. No doubt about it. What was in doubt was who started the fire. Hitler said they were communists. He said, there's a communist conspiracy in this country. It's going to destroy us. You have to give me all of the authority. You have to surrender your liberties, and I'll keep you safe. We know what happened. In 9-11, same thing happened. We were told, oh, we have Islamic terrorists. They're everywhere. They're going to kill us. In order to be safe, you have to give me, the President of the United States, total power. Oh, we have to be able to spy on you. Oh, we're going to suspend habeas corpus. We're going to do all these things because we need to keep you safe. Well, what's the point then? You know, What's the point of surrendering who you are and your identity for safety? You can only do that if you feel really, really afraid. It only works if there's fear. If there's no fear, in your right mind, you would never make that trade-off. Never. It would never occur to you to do that. It's only fear that makes it possible. So, as Manson said, get the fear, you know? Uh, fear is this great motivator of people, and fear is used to keep us from looking at what may have really happened, what may have really transpired. So, uh, when we talk about a secret space program, as I've said before, why wouldn't there be a secret space program? Why wouldn't there be? We have a lot of people here. We are afraid of certain things, and the people with power are afraid of something else. The people with power are afraid this planet may become uninhabitable soon. They're afraid there may be wars over water. There may be wars over clean air. Whether or not you believe in global warming, whether or not you believe it was created by humans or not, not the issue. The people in charge, they won't tell you this, but they do believe in global warming. They do believe that the planet is gradually becoming less and less inhabitable. So there would be a secret space program. There would be a program to get as many of their people off planet as possible. Why not? Why wouldn't there be? That's a pretty good investment, I think, of time, resources, money, technology, whatever. Uh, we know that individual entrepreneurs are developing their own space shuttles, charging a few million dollars for a seat. That should tell you something, what it's going to cost us to get off this planet, if we had to, for any particular reason. You know, so there are, are there people willing to say, uh, we're building our own rocket ships, like in a Ray Bradbury story, you know? We're going to have our own rocket ships, we're going to leave. You know, and all you guys are going to have to stay behind and deal with whatever it is that, whatever mess we've created. So yes, these secrets will exist. They have to. I mean, the people in charge are not stupid. You know, we may think they're stupid. We laugh at our politicians in every country. But they're not all that stupid. Some of them are. You know, some of them are reptiles. You know, to use a David Icke expression. Um, I'm speaking metaphorically. He's not, but we think, I think we agree. It's common ground there. Um, so you have to ask yourself, what is your, what is your position on this? Where, where do you fit in? Where do we as individuals fit in? You know, if the government can keep secrets, as they did with the space program, as they did with paperclip, as they did with the assassinations, as they did with Admiral Byrd's diaries, for crying out loud, if the government keeps those secrets, why can't we have our own secrets? You know? Why, as individuals, we're not allowed to have a patriot act for ourselves? Why can't we tell our governments, no, you can't have this information about me, it's classified. A friend of mine, a guy called Norman Mailer, uh, years ago during Watergate, came up with the idea that the people should have their own CIA. This was his concept. He said there should be a people's CIA. You know, to go up, to work against the other CIA. We should be collecting our own information. Well, things like WikiLeaks have made this possible, right? So the internet has made this possible. We have the information available to us. We can start digging. People do come out of the woodwork. They do start spilling their guts, you know. There are people who are close to what's going on, who have a little piece of information, and they're willing to share it. And these people, when you put these pieces together, you can start to see what's really going on. That's a good thing. But also we have to have a way to protect our own information. This is a thing that governments will never agree to. They will say, wait a minute, you know, we're keeping secrets. We have our classification systems. We have documents. We have things that you're not supposed to know because you can't handle the truth, as Jack Nicholson said. You can't handle it. But yet they give to themselves the right to know everything they possibly can about you. 
How does that happen? You know, how does that work? So I think Norman Mailer was right. What you need is uh, a way to collect information to defend yourselves against the collection of information against you. And there has to be a way to do this. Um, and in the secret space programs that we're talking about, we'll continue to talk about today, you're going to hear about a lot of secrecy. You're going to hear about a lot of uh, suggestions for new types of technology that have been going on. We know that technologies exist, for instance, that would give us free energy or close to free energy. And they've been in existence for a long time. We can't get access to that, you know, uh, because of government policies, because of secrecy, because of classified documents, because of the opposition by corporations. So our lives are on the line, you know, because of these uh, policies that are taken, these positions that are taken. And they're not taken by you and, you and me. They're not taken by people in general. It's not all of us getting together and saying, why, no, we shouldn't have free energy. That's horrible. You know, none of us would agree to that. And yet we have to accept it. And this is what's wrong. This is the kind of mentality that helped to support the space program back in the 1940s and 50s when we brought Nazi scientists over. We were not allowed to object. People did. People did. Jewish organizations wrote letters complaining to Truman, wrote letters complaining to the Pentagon about bringing Nazi scientists to the United States. Truman was on their side. Truman forbade the Pentagon from bringing Nazis to the United States. He said, no, we will not do this. This, this, this barters our soul. You can't possibly cut deals with these murderers. The Pentagon ignored him. That's how much power the president has, right? The Pentagon ignored him. They totally ignored him. And internally, the memos that have surfaced in the last few years show that they thought, well, the Jews are overreacting. You know, they saw those films about the Holocaust. We can't trust their judgment right now. Excuse me? How could anyone who had seen the film clips in the late 1940s as they came out of Germany and were being showed at every movie theater in the United States and all the soldiers coming back talking about liberating the camps, how could anybody have said the Jews were overreacting? You know, they're just being emotional. I know. Must be that time of the month for the Jews. But that's what, that's what the reaction was. And it's chilling to read this in the documents that have been declassified. Go online and find them. They're there. You, know. you can read this for yourself. It is, it is astonishing. Read a book by Linda Hunt called Secret Agenda. Great book. Okay? She goes into a lot of detail. She reproduces these documents. Uh, it was very difficult to get a copy of this book in the United States after it was published. When I was researching uh, Sinister Forces, and I was looking for a copy of, of Secret Agenda by Linda Hunt, I had to get a copy in French because there were no copies at all in the United States at that time. You could not get a used copy. You could not get a new copy. There was nothing. Luckily, I can read French. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? But I did manage to get the book in French. Now you can get it, you can download it, but you can't get it in print. And here's a book that blew the lid off what was taking place with the paperclip program and how we had been lied to by so many people regarding the Nazi uh, background of people like Werner von Braun and Dornberg or Strugold and everyone else. All the Nazis. We're talking thousands that were brought over. Not a few hundred, as normally the history books will tell you. Many more than that. And the paperclip program went all the way through the 1960s, boys and girls. It wasn't just the 1940s or even the 1950s. It went all the way up to 1960 and beyond. We were bringing scientists over that late, wherever we could find them, giving them jobs, setting them up. They became wealthy in many cases. Von Braun did, Dornberger did, as they were plotting to kill political leaders and doing all sorts of other things. We gave them a lot of work and a lot of money. You know. This is the information that we need in order to make decisions about who we're supporting, uh, what programs we support, what policies we support. We don't know enough to make these decisions yet because we've been lied to for so long. But if we go on the supposition that everything is lies and we'll never know the truth, we will freeze, our gears will freeze and we'll stop. You know, we won't go any further. We will say to ourselves, well, we'll never know anything. It's all a secret, it's a mystery. We'll have to give up. Don't do that, you know, don't do that. Don't deny what people like the WikiLeaks founder was doing or the people who are blowing the whistle to WikiLeaks, actually. Are all these people going on the line and saying, here's what's really going on, here are the memos, here's the real history of the world being told in, in these memos. Don't deny their sacrifice. They are trying to get this word out. They're trying to make every one of us 
aware of what's really going on. It makes for very sad reading, of course. Some of it is chilling. Some of it is just depressing. But we need to know. We need to know what's really going on. Um, are we... Oh, officially we're not, no problem. <laughs> but I won't keep you going very much longer. I think you've heard what I have to say. I think that um, the other speakers are going to have their own angles on all of this and expand it even more. But I just wanted to give you a lot of things to think about. Think about uh, the assassination of Kennedy because it brings all of these elements together in very unusual ways. Uh, think about the weird churches that were involved because we know more about them today than we knew even 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, these churches are still involved. They were involved in Iran-Contra. They were involved in the former Yugoslavia in all of the fighting that was going on there. Church leaders, their names are connected to all of this. They're still running operations. It's still a covert ops organization. The American Orthodox Catholic Church, you'll find them everywhere. And they're running agents all sorts of places. Not everyone is an agent. Some of them are very sincere people, but not many. So keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on what's going on. When you find anomalies in the news as you're reading it, pay attention. When you find things that don't quite make sense, pay attention. When a name shows up in one news story that had showed up in one five years ago that you remember, pay attention. You know, When these things happen, when these so-called coincidences take place, that's when you realize there's the action of what I call the sinister forces at work. So if you pay attention, you will learn something. It will make you a little nervous, it will make you a little fearful, but it will be real information. It will be something you can really know and use and understand. So thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.